Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, I dare say that the people that are behind the camera are that much more important than the people who are in front of it. And you know what? If you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you are in the seats with once more, as always. My name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of entertainment industry professionals, and we pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and in a conversational fashion. And, you know, if you like how we do things around here, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that you do, because, let's face it, you're listening right now. Uh, subscribe. Please subscribe to the podcast. Hit that subscribe button. You know, you know, smash that like button. Give us the old five-star rating on your podcast provider of choice. We're pretty much everywhere. We're over at Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, and plus we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In the C2 YouTube channel. So if you can give us a like and subscribe there as well, we would absolutely appreciate it. Also, don't hesitate to check us out on social media. We're on the Facebook. We're on the Twitter. We're on the Instagram, we're on the TikTok, and we're on the Letterboxd for all sorts of fun updates. And finally, and we do dare say most importantly, please pay us a visit over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca, for all the latest and greatest from the world of television, film, basically the moving image at large. Because, you know, if we love to watch it and write it and talk about it, we love it when you come by and read about it and listen about it. So please, pay us a visit. On this episode, we got a fun one. We got a real fun one. Something, something, we're, something we're trying new. Something we're trying new because uh, we've had the unique pleasure of sitting down and talking with one of the best cinematographers, cinematographers working today by the name of Kramer Morgenthau. A couple of months ago, we had we talked to him about his film Spirited, which. Uh, which uh, was playing on Apple Plus. It's a fun movie, you know. It's Will Smith. It's uh, and Will Will Ferrell, excuse me. Uh, Ryan Reynolds singing songs, talking about Christmas. But uh, also, he just happened to be the man behind uh, the lens for Michael B. Jordan's debut feature in Creed Three, which was shot in IMAX gloriously, and it is on. It is in theaters now. I do recommend you go check it out and try to see it in IMAX if you can because it is just a stunning, stunning piece of work. But, uh, like I said, we were talking with a, we're talking with a guy who knows how to make films look good. When we talked about Spirited a couple of months back, and quite frankly we forgot to publish, but uh, when we were talking about that, we were talking about just sort of the complexities of the set and, and sort of shooting these big musical numbers with all these moving parts and just making it look slick and fun and real. While with Creed, uh, we talked about the use of IMAX inside the boxing ring, which created this really sort of expansive world for such a intimate, intimate combat sport, and it made it look absolutely amazing this guy is unequivocally one of the best cinematographers working out there today and if you haven't already seen spirited on the uh apple plus streaming service check it out or if you haven't seen creed 3 which is in theaters now check that out as well but first enjoy our talk with kramer because between our double talk with kramer our double it's two episodes in one double talk with kramer because uh Quite frankly, both conversations are really good. Uh, to too. Obviously, just to, to kick it off officially, I mean, just thank you so much for the time today, and, and congratulations on the film. I loved it. Thank you so much. Now, I guess my first question... Thank you, really proud of it. Oh, as well, you should be. But I mean, I, I guess my first question is sort of walk me through uh, uh, getting the phone call to be uh, to be involved in this project. Um, you know, it was, a uh, you know, happened over the pandemic the process of you know getting the call so everything was on zoom and you know we never really i never met the director uh sean in person and um you know it was a process of uh talking about it on on, on zoom um like we are now and uh she's always you know an, an adjustment i think uh i always do better in the room but you know we just had a a shared uh you know affection for um you know lush musicals and um movies that have you know messages and meaning and without being you know heavy-handed but that are, that are also fun and uh, um we just kind of connected on that now and this is something i'm always kind of fascinated about because i mean obviously 
due to the nature of the show and i mean because it's a musical and there's all these different set pieces i mean i'm kind of curious for you as a cinematographer does 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 that just add on extra piles of work or is it or does it sort of simplify things to let you sort of block out each number and sort of tackle it that way uh you know it's a it's a great question i you know when i signed on to the film i thought it was just kind of a um you know a fun um fairly simple uh musical uh and kind of comedy and um you know what it really grew into in, in a in a great way was it's it was kind of an an epic and uh, had kind of every possible environment and um you know giant musical sequences that resembled you know a broadway musical sequence kind of time six you know much bigger than broadway in a way because it was a larger uh a larger canvas um you know broadway is usually just you know one angle <coughs> you know a proscenium and you stage it for that but this was a musical stage 360 degrees and um you know for multiple cameras and it was a, yeah it was a it was a, a much bigger um endeavor than i ever imagined it would be and uh, it was a huge challenge um it was a lot a lot more complicated than, than a simple film uh simple drama or you know um kind of more like uh in some ways an action movie or uh even a boxing movie or that kind of thing where the boxing is a lot of, like dance but with 300 boxers <laughs> <laughs> and i mean it, it's one of those things like i'm always kind of amazed when i'm watching something and uh, it's a it's an environment where a spotlight fits you know what i mean i mean in terms of can you talk a little bit in terms of because i mean obviously it takes a village to do all this stuff but i mean i love very much just the use of light on on this like especially as it jumps from sort of scenario to scenario for you was was that important in terms and in terms of helping to establish mood as well because i mean obviously there's lighter moments there's serious moments but there every moment still needs to be able to work if with a spotlight on it if somebody sort of breaks into a solo yeah exactly so i i worked with a broadway lighting designer named don holder and um you know, all the lighting is designed uh, to the beat, to the lyric, to the story that's within being told within the song. And, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, Don did an incredible job designing those sequences, um, the lighting. And, you know, I, I worked closely with him and we, you know, found, uh, you know, ways to put light in all the right places at all the right moments, which is a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a big task, but it's, a, it's, it's really a, a fun, creative thing that I had never done before. Uh, that kind of lighting where it's very sculpted and accentuated and um, very, uh, you know, pointed, pointing the audience towards where to look with the light um, in a very, very, special way that um you know broadway is is known for you know um and uh so i was lucky to find don who's a you know tony award-winning um lighting designer and uh because when we decided to push the dance and song and dance sequences toward the full full on broadway treatment kind of breaking the fourth wall um you know that's not my that's not my specialty um so I, I learned so much from don and i think don also learned from us working you know um for the screen whereas he's used to working for uh again a proscenium angle a single angle single axis usually but i mean at the same time you get to do a little bit of that as well i mean i mean even thinking specifically of the scene change with the uh, with ryan and will from the the soup kitchen to the hospital uh, just where you're holding on the shot and it's we're we're changing into a completely different set. I mean, is that how oh, do you, yeah. how do you sort of like how do you design that? That's all you know preconceived, um, <laughs> pre-visualized, and uh, that was really a lot of that was driven by Sean Anders, our director, and he really wanted to have almost like a, a practical, like on a Broadway stage where the walls fly in and um, people move the set. People pieces out and that's what that hospital we swung uh in the soup kitchen we 
had the wall of the hospital built and it got pushed into the background by some of the dancers who are in the shot and then visual effects kind of takes over where it blends into the hospital. But uh, that's a, yeah, completely in the traumatic scenes, there's, you know, amazing transitions happening, you know, where he goes through a closet and down a, a cable, you know, over a skyscraper and onto an ice skating rink. And it was all, uh, all in the script and all in Sean's imagination and all storyboarded very carefully storyboarded. So we knew what we were doing, what we needed to build, how, you know, build physically what we could achieve uh, with CGI and what, you know, what the lighting changes that needed to happen to allow it to be all believable that you're kind of going through these really fun environments. It's, it's like a fable or a fairy tale where you're just kind of, no, I mean that Going. that leads into my next question because I mean obviously I mean there's obviously some bits where you know there's visual effects being used, but at the same time, this never felt like a movie that felt like it was leaning on visual effects. And I mean, I'm kind of curious, uh when you're building these shots and you're building these transitions, like how do you like do you try to you do as much in camera as you can, or do you like where does the where does the line basically where you have to sort of switch over to the computer? Um, I think you know, the goal was to do as much of it in camera as possible. And um, that was Sean's goal to be able to achieve it in camera with practical set pieces that, that move around. And I think where the computer takes over is where it either got too big or expensive or um, just impossible, you know, so there need to be some sort of handoff, digital handoff at some point. Um Certainly when they're going through a closet and flying through, you know, the New York night sky um, into a skating rink that involved, you know, three different to achieve that one transition it involved three different um, sets it involved the closet, three or four different sets, the closet, a door at the actual soup kitchen, which, which was actually just a school. Um, the actor hanging on cables against blue screen, uh, a double on cables against blue screen, um, and then uh, a double landing on the ice on cables um, on the ice set. And I think we also built part of the closet as well. So it was like, you know, all these different elements just to achieve that very quick transition and make it all seamless and um uh, fun for the audience it, it, it really feels like part of the joy of your job is being able to sort of uh adapt to the story because i mean obviously a job like this is going to be very different from being in the ring on something like creed or even you know sort of being in the food truck on something like chef like for, if, does the job change sort of from project to project or are there things that you learn along the way that you're able to sort of apply and, and sort of tweak and work with as you go forward I think it's a bit of both. I think um, you definitely gain wisdom and, and a skill set um, as you go along and making all these different movies that I've been lucky to, to work on. Um, and you build a, you know, a toolbox and you build a, um, you know, kind of a, an approach. Uh, uh, and then you throw that all out the window and each <laughs> project is com completely different and you have to be a chameleon um to adapt you know every director is completely different their method of working is completely different i had never done a musical before i had always wanted to do a musical so this was a, a you know huge uh dream of mine to be able to work on a musical and um i think that you know cinema is musical and uh, it's a natural um you know uh, synergy to, to put the two together um and, uh, you know, you, one minute you're working on a very cramped food truck, you know, figuring out how to make the perfect Cubano sandwich. And um, the next minute you're you've got 50 dancers on the biggest, you know, set build, uh, you know, you ever seen in your life. In, uh, and, you know, 300 or 400 lighting fixtures uh, you have to, you know, figure out how to program and 
tell the story of the music with. They're just all so different. And, you know, and, and the one is a director who wants to work documentary style and one is a director who wants to do these beautiful in-camera seamless transitions. And it's your job to, you know, um, find the path of, uh, of uh, creativity that, that helps bring it out um, um, in a way that, uh, you know, br- that you bring something to the table as well. Well, I mean, I, not- I mean, obviously, you know, I mean, it really strikes me that the re- you, you've got to have a great relationship with your director to really be able to achieve something special. Because, I mean, obviously, on one end, while you're there to help service Sean's vision, Sean's vision isn't necessarily going to get serviced without sort of the creative tools that you bring to the table either. Yeah, in many, in many ways, you know, Sean casts cast you as the way he will cast a, an actor. And, and, you know, he wants the actor to do of course the role but he also wants the actor to bring something to the role and um and they you know uh they cast you because they they see a potential to bring something to the table and they, you don't know it always know what that is but it's uh you know um i think i you know he liked the way i approach the boxing and creed and boxing is in a way you know a form of dance and um um and he wanted to bring color um, and expressive lighting to this project um, much more uh, elevated and uh, accelerated kind of lighting styles. And I think he had seen some of that and some things I've done and, um, and uh, hopefully we, we achieved that uh, with this. I think this is some of the most colorful and most, um, you know, uh, pushed uh visually pushed uh work i've done and 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 had so much fun being you know unless you're being um directed in that direction or you know working a director that gives you license to do that um you know it's it's hard to do that kind of work um just you know showing up and uh without um a director that's kind of bringing that out for sure, for sure. Well, I mean, just wasn't, so, the most, wasn't the most articulate the last couple of sentences. No, but. no, no, it's okay, it's okay. But I mean, just to put a bow on this, I mean, this is something, again, that always kind of fascinates me because, I mean, obviously, as the cinematographer, you're going to be the guy probably closest to, to people like Will and Ryan literally on set as they're doing their work. How do you keep a straight face? Because, I mean, even though you know the stuff that's coming, you don't always know. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, working with Will and Ryan is... Um, you know, it's like one of the great, uh, life experiences, uh, I've had and just to be up close with these guys and there's a tremendous amount of trust they put in you and, um, and also you're hanging out and they're, you know, it's a constant, um, kind of, uh, stand up kind of situation. Right. You, know, you never know what's, uh, will, what kind of, you know what thing will or Ryan, uh, you know, might throw at you in terms of just playing, uh, being fun and, and silly on set. But, um, also they were very, uh, focused cause they had, neither of them had done anything like this before. Maybe will more, but doing uh choreo, you know, memorizing choreography and singing, you know, leading a musical being the leads in the musical was a, a big, um, you know, big heavy lift for those guys so they were you know they were fun but they were also they had to be serious because they had to they had to perform they couldn't just do the usual um you know there is a really great buddy movie slapstick kind of stuff a lot of great physical comedy in this movie but there's also like 10 other elements in the film there's a love story there's a musical um there is uh, a christmas carol um you know there's time passage there's a message film there's a you know kind of a coming of age for ryan um if you will uh you know a, you know maturing of his characters so there's all these different arcs that they have to hit including the kind of really fun buddy movie that that people wanted to see with them for sure but you know what kramer man i mean just this is i really think this is a fantastic piece of work because i mean obviously we've seen adaptations of this story before but 
this really does manage to carve out a very distinct and unique place sort of in the lore of it all and i mean i think a big part of that is just how fantastic it all looks and obviously you you play a big part in that but just again congrats on the work and thank you so much for the time today man keep it up thanks david i really uh appreciate it thanks for the interest in the in the work and uh for covering it all right well i mean kramer obviously first off man just thank you so much for the time today man and congrats on the movie i got to see it this week and in imax man i mean it's a hell of a piece of work Thank you so much. I'm so happy you got to see the IMAX because that's the, the, it's the ultimate way to see the film. And, uh, you know, we carefully, uh, you know, compose it and uh, shot it to, to be seen that way. So now, I mean, I guess my first question is like, walk me through sort of those initial meetings w- with Michael, because I mean, obviously he is a first time director. And I mean, wanting to shoot an IMAX on top of that is definitely a, a pretty big swing on his part. Oh, yeah, I mean, he was not uh, my first meetings with Michael were, you know, he was swinging, um, swinging for the fences or whatever the expression is. And he uh, was not was shy. Knockout, about, as it were. Yeah. Yeah. He was going for, you know, a knockout um, on his first on his first swing. And um, I think he, he achieved that because uh, the success of this picture is just unprecedented. We had no idea it was going to do this well. So we're just all, you know, jumping out of our seats and thrilled. Um, he was like, yeah, he wanted, you know, every time this is my second Creed movie and every, you know, every director wants to um, do something different than, uh, you know, the, the prior movie in the franchise. Actually, this is Rocky nine. I think it is. Yeah. So, you know, um, if you look at it that way or the ninth movie in the franchise. So it's, you know, how do you honor um, the franchise and the legacy and how do you differentiate yourself? And then on top of it, you know, one thing was definitely the IMAX. The other thing was he brought in this whole language of anime um, and his whole, you know, character subjectivity that it's, you know, he knows that character Adonis Creed better than anybody. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe Ryan Coogler, but, uh, knows it equally well, but, uh, he knows that guy. And then, uh, um, uh, another guy named, uh, D'Lo, who's a friend of, uh, uh, Ryan Coogler, uh, is the character of, um, Diamond Dame is based on on D'Lo, so D'Angelo. Uh, anyway, that's my answer. <laughs> and I mean, is this a is this a podcast or is this an audio? It's audio. It's gonna be audio this... only. So yeah, no worries, man. But I mean, just Sorry. Yeah, yeah. no. But I mean, from that opening from that opening scene, like right after the cre- like right after we hit into the movie and, and we're there, and I mean, I just had this sort of oof kind of feeling, like just. I can't remember the last time I saw something that was shot, obviously, in IMAX that was big. But, I mean, the idea of big in a boxing setting, which is so intimate and so close, almost feels like it's not one of those things that I would ever put two and two together. Can you talk to me a little bit just about the complexities, uh, specifically of shooting the boxing, which is very close quarters, but, again, in this expansive format? Um, Yeah, shooting... uh... You know, we found out after the fact that we were the first sports movie to be shot in IMAX. We didn't even realize that. So that was a, a really cool thing. And, you know, in retrospect, it's kind of a no brainer to shoot uh, IMAX uh, for an event like that. It's, uh, you know, it's a an epic event and um, you want it in the story. It's, you know, these guys are on a world stage um, uh, taking out their kind of childhood trauma uh with their fists uh in front of the entire world for you know um millions of dollars uh, you know of their prize money and it's just this you know it doesn't get more shakespearean than that and um and imax is like the ultimate you know shakespeare would have used imax if he was around today i think (laughs) i I don't want to sound sound pretentious it might sound pretentious but it's a I mean it, you know, in a, in the best of the best of way. It's just, you know, um, he did circle in the round and, uh, you know, uh, we're doing IMAX. So no, I mean, I guess that, that leads into the next question and specifically for the bot, like, are you in there with the rig, like shooting in the ring with the IMAX rig? Because I mean, it's definitely not, I mean, it's bigger than a traditional kind of camera setup, right? 
Like, I'm just curious about the complexities of, you know, sort of mapping that out inside a limited space. Yeah, I think uh, the IMAX camera, uh, I mean, they're different. Is There are some uh, different understandings of what an IMAX camera is, but the actual IMAX film camera is enormous and it's like a lawnmower and it's, you know, last three minutes. We weren't using that. We were using okay. sort of dig- digital cameras that were IMAX, um, you know, uh, had the IMAX specs, but it was not. So it was, uh, it looks more like a traditional digital camera and um, it was a, a Sony Venice and um, it was on a steady cam in the ring most of the time. And we also shot four cameras simultaneously um and we had a sometimes it was two cameras in the ring a steady cam and a handheld camera our operators um mike heathcote uh and brig uh foster owens um were in there with uh you know dancing with the boxers all the time wild now i mean obviously sort of the end sequence where you know we have the penultimate fight I mean, it's such a huge and sort of overwhelming sequence. I mean, was it Dodger Stadium or was it sort of m- m- modeled to look like Dodger Stadium? Can you talk to me a little bit about sort of how much you have to map out I- in a sequence like that where really, because I mean, there's overheads, there's drones, you're you're swooping through the crowd. There's There's so much going on. I've got to imagine from a logistical standpoint this this probably took like a solid month to sort of map out before you actually shot it yeah we definitely mapped everything out for the dodger stadium sequence um the final fight i should say um we shot plates um visual effects team shot plates in dodger stadium uh, including drones um planes trains and automobiles and everything under the sun we used to shoot this with uh we had a crane um, all the time. Uh, we shot the boxing on a soundstage. Uh, and then the backgrounds were a you know, major contribution by the visual effects team. Um, there was digital doubles. There were real tiles of people. And then we had real extras surrounding the ring. Um, the stunt team shot pre during prep. Uh, we had our camera operator embedded with the stunt team weeks in advance um so he was completely almost like another boxer um in there with them and we shot listed everything uh we had storyboards um it was a uh, you know a lot of prep went into um that uh the dodger stadium and, and all the fights so well and i mean that's something that like dovetails into something else i want to ask because i mean obviously as we've said in sort of in, especially in this final fight it's that de- there's definitely a psychological aspect. We we see it more getting into the care like Adonis's head, and like we because obviously there are those sort of I guess you know sort of the anime sequences or just sort of him in the cage kind of thing. How do you manage to sort of I guess transition sort of the real to sort of the effects that have to happen that aren't in camera? Um, how do you how do you match the how yeah, you, yeah, because it all because I mean it all runs so seamlessly and it all feels so effortless. Like we transition from sort of Dodger Stadium to Adonis really in his own mind almost effortlessly. Oh yeah, that um I think you're talking about the uh round eleven, um the Yes, boy. exactly. Yeah. It's one of my favorite sequences in the whole movie. And that was all Michael B. Jordan's concept and um you know, the audience fades out and the sound change, sound design changes. And we go into these kind of hyper real wide angle lenses and the lighting is all inspired by um, the, uh, the flashback sequence. And so we brought lighting in from the liquor store where the, uh, I don't want to be a spoiler, but you know, where events happen at the liquor store and at the, um, uh, the foster home where they're living and, um, and then the police lights when the police show up is all in into that lighting and it was a lot of a lot of thought that went into how that was achieved and um it's just uh you know it's just michael's imagination um uh, kind of on the screen it was such a thrill to to uh to shoot that sequence and and so thrilled how it came out in the movie and um uh and how the audience really liked it some people liked it some people didn't but i uh i loved it now, I mean, how was, I'm kind of curious how Michael was to work with, because I mean, obviously he's a first time director. I mean, 
it's great to have all the vision in the world, but at the same time, you need to be able to lean on people who know how to pull it off at the same time. How was that sort of dynamic with with uh, with him as as you guys sort of led this movie and sort of got to the finished product, which obviously we're seeing on screen now? Yeah, and no, working with Michael was is one of the great um, life experiences I've had. Uh, you know, as a person, as a cinematographer, as a filmmaker. Um, great friendships uh in my life and um he uh was a natural um director and uh i think he's been studying other filmmakers uh as he's worked as an actor you know he's been in movies since he was in television since he was 16 years old um so for the last 20 years he's been like a sponge and studying um that's been his film school um and he also knows that character better than any other person out there. Adonis Creed, you know, is a part of him. So story and character were like, he didn't have to do anything for that. And then in terms of technical chops, um, you know, we've been talking, you know, I've this is my third film with him. Um, and, uh, you know, we've been talking shots and lenses and and all that um, light Um you know, uh, texture, camera movement. Uh, he loves the steady cam. You know, um, I think he would have been a DP, you know, in another lifetime. <laughs> so he's, you know, it, it was a, it, it was a natural segue for him. It was kind of effortless. Um, and he just hired people that were experienced and, um, trusted, trusted me, you know, and, um, some people, some first time directors are very mistrustful and right. um, he is, a, that's just not who he is as a person. And um, he's trusting and uh, allows people to, um, you know, contribute. And uh, that's how he gets the best out of, out of people. And I love, um, I love it. He knows how to get the best out of people. And that's half of what directing is, you know, sure. uh, enabling people and, um, and, and trusting people and, uh, and uh you know it's a dialogue excellent man now i mean as i mentioned before like initially i hadn't thought of boxing as i'm IMA and imax being able to go together but now after having seen this film i'm like they're peanut butter and jelly like they're perfect together i'm kind of yeah. curious from your perspective what is it about the sport of boxing that is just so damn cinematic uh i think it, boxing is is um you know super cinematic and i think it's because it's um it's very similar to dance um and um it has a bit of dance in it it has a bit yeah. of performance in it has it has violence um it has a story and it's inside the boxing match there's a story being told um you know people speaking with their fists instead of with their mouths and very similar to sign language you know which is also a big part of this movie um and it's uh you know boxing is like theater as well and it's uh and performance and you know it's 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 kind of like a modern gladiator sport and yeah. um so people uh you know it's an audience and it's an audience you know participatory uh sport as well so um it's just an it's a natural uh thing for for a giant screen no, and I mean, I agree with you, man, because I mean, there's always a good, I've always felt there's always been a good story inside a good fight, but also story and movement as well. And I mean, this is such a a fantastic example of how movement can tell story. And I mean, I think that's something that we tend to get, we tend to lose a lot. I mean, to me, this feels like this would have been the same movie had there been no dialogue. You know what I mean? I, yeah, no, I agree. This would have been a great silent film, you know? It's, yeah, uh... Exactly. Part of it is sign with the sign language, you know. So for sure. But I mean Kramer, man, I think you guys have done a fantastic piece of work with their this. And I mean, I'm so glad audiences are 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 jumping on board and you know, wanting to see it again and again. But yeah, you know, just again, keep up the good work and man, thank you so much for the time today. Thanks, David. Thank you so much. And don't forget to to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD Blu-ray rental 
or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs. <laughs> 